Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's special program. I'm Dan Lewin, the president and CEO of CHM. CHM, Computer History Museum. CHM is a leading institution chronicling the history and impact of computing technologies. Over the past four decades, we've built the world's foremost collection and exhibitions to tell the story of the digital revolution, from the people, to the companies, to the inventions that have changed the world. Our new mission spans the computing past, the digital present, and the future impact of technology on humanity. With this in mind, CHM can also represent computing, humanity, and meaning. What does it mean to be human in a world that does not exist without computing? We live in a transformational era, an era when computing has become ubiquitous and ambient. And because computing touches all of our lives, we are all part of this story. The decisions we make today about our technology will determine the direction of our lives tomorrow. As digital citizens, we can make a difference in how technology can shape a better future for ourselves and for our communities. In that spirit, it is with great pleasure that tonight we present the third of four 2021 Fellow Awards programs. Who are the computing pioneers and visionaries we celebrate as CHM Fellows? What motivated them? And how can they inspire us to build a better future? Here's a short video to introduce our Fellow Award program and to let you hear from some of the 90 honorees who we have celebrated over the past three decades. In the words of Dr. Katherine Johnson, and I quote, you are providing a platform for so many to share their story and together we are rewriting history in a way that allows everyone to see their place. For more than three decades, the Computer History Museum has reserved one honor for a distinguished circle of individuals who have advanced the field of computing. So I figured that if I could start on the ground floor with other people, then I'd have a chance to get ahead. And that was what led me to write the first compiler back in 1952. And it was set up as a, as a crusade rather than to make money. The CHM Fellow Awards recognize technology pioneers, legends, and unsung heroes who have illuminated our world and propelled humanity forward. The semiconductor industry has made bigger changes in a few decades than printing has over a few centuries. When these things actually start to connect, you get the wow effect. Democracy, freedom, prosperity, they all stem from technological innovation. We've got to make a society that will last, that is sustainable as a society. That's one of the reasons I developed my computer and gave it away. I wanted to help that revolution go forward. If every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting. When the ideas start, they are fragile and they're new. And most people don't understand them. And the things that are fragile need to be protected. They are the dreamers who imagine beyond what is, the disruptors who challenge convention, the builders who transform our world, they are the history makers who inspire us all to keep exploring and creating new ways to shape a better future for everyone. As we navigate through the challenges of a global pandemic, the museum is pressed forward to honor this year's fellows through a year long series of innovative virtual programs that have made it possible for our community to participate, whether from the Bay Area, Boston, Beijing, or beyond. In fact, these programs are an example of our transformation to CHM 3.0, of our focus to reimagine CHM to engage millions of people around the world to harness technology for positive social impact. How are we transforming? We are expanding our vibrant community that encompasses history's tech pioneers and today's innovators, business and government leaders, 
thought leaders and academics, educators and students, strong partners and engaged digital citizens. And we're committed to including an increasingly diverse array of voices. We're convening crucial conversations about the promise and the perils of technology affecting economic and social change on a global scale. We're investing in and partnering with leading firms to apply state-of-the-art technologies to the creation of a 21st century museum. Over time, we envision offering open access to anyone, anywhere, in their own language through dynamic physical and digital programming, content, and experiences. And speaking of applying cutting edge technologies, would you be surprised to discover that right now I'm speaking to you from inside a new digital twin of CHM? Through our collaboration with Accenture, museum visitors from around the world will soon have the opportunity to interact in this high definition virtual reality environment and experience our programming and exhibits in a new way. Let's have a quick look around. We will have life-size digital representations of our exhibits. Some will be interactive and enable visitors to discover, engage, learn, or share their views with others. We also have our multifunctional Han Auditorium where organizations can gather for presentations, conversations, conferences, or celebrations like this one, or even virtual hackathons. Tonight, we're excited to give you this sneak preview of our virtual CHM. Over the coming weeks and months, we invite you to come and explore and ideate with us. As we transform to CHM 3.0, we're making rapid progress, but there's still a long road ahead. We invite you to join us on this journey and help us bring to life this vision so we can expand our impact. I hope you're as excited about these new capabilities and changes as I am. They're made possible through our incredible museum trustees and staff and team, as well as our fantastic donors, sponsors, and partners. Accenture is both an extraordinary strategic partner for building our new virtual CHM, as well as our 2021 fellow program headline sponsor. This is the eighth year that Accenture has provided support as our headline sponsor, and we couldn't be more pleased to be innovating together with them, our museum for the future. So it is with great and special admiration and appreciation that I now introduce CHM trustee and Group Chief Executive of Technology and CTO of Accenture, Paul Doherty. Paul is standing by in real life. Thank you, Daniel. And what an exciting time for CHM. As always, it's a pleasure to join with you and everyone who supports the Computer History Museum, especially during these 2021 Fellows events and whenever we come together to celebrate the undeniable impact of technology and computing on the world. I'm not alone in the hope that soon we'll be able to all get together again in this beautiful space, dedicated, as Daniel just described, to computing, humanity, and meaning. And as we've seen throughout this extraordinary time, technology, innovation, and computing, along with human resilience, have enabled us to not only stay connected, but create special and unique interactions and new meaning for all of us and our work. While we may be apart at this time, through the magic of technology, we can defy the limitations of time and space and interact in a virtual world. As Daniel demonstrated just moments ago within the digital twin of the Computer History Museum, the museum goes beyond capturing and reflecting past accomplishments. It's embracing the present with real-time developments in computing and technology, and it's looking to the future to explore how the intersection of human ingenuity and technology can bring the greatest positive social impact. Tonight, we'll see and hear firsthand just how impactful one individual can be as we honor Andy Van Dam, a visual visionary whose technological and artistic palette is the computer itself. As with a sculptor or painter, he wields a special brush and chisel, we call it code, to create new worlds and to improve the one we have now. But Andy's greatest impact may be as an educator, for he's exerted untold influence on thousands of other artists, technologists, and visionaries. Andy. I join them to thank you for your genius, your gift of mentorship, and your incredible artistry and imagination. On behalf of Accenture, which sponsors the 2021 Fellows, we congratulate you on this honor that recognizes your innovative spirit and your dedication to the world of computing, the fulfillment of the human potential, and the effort to bring new meaning to this important work. 
At Accenture, we believe that access to opportunity in education and the elevation of diverse voices is critical to solving some of the world's greatest challenges. By bringing the incredible collection of the CHM to life in a virtual world, we hope to inspire the next generation of game changers like Andy by meeting them wherever they may be on their journey. Stay tuned for much, much more to come. And back to you, Daniel. Yes, there is much, much more to come. Thank you, Paul, and all of our collaborators and friends at Accenture. We're also excited to inspire the next generation of game changers. Empowering the next generation is a focus we also share with our education sponsors, First Tech, the KLA Foundation, and Oracle. To all of our sponsors, we express appreciation for the generous support that makes possible our year-long Fellows Awards program. Thank you. During 2021, CHM is pleased to honor four fellows. Collaborative technology creator and entrepreneur, Raymond Ozzi. AI and robotics pioneer, Raj Reddy. Computer artist, Lillian Schwartz. And tonight's honoree in computer graphics and hypertext pioneer and computer science educator, Andres Van Dam, known to most simply as Andy. The museum is honored to shine a bright light on Andy's spirit to preserve and share his remarkable story, to examine the relevance of his work for us today, and to inspire the next generation. Given Andy's pioneering work and graphics, it only seemed appropriate that we take this opportunity to announce our virtual museum. But as you'll see, this entire show uses cutting edge graphics and virtual technology. Let's pull back the curtain. You'll see I'm not in the museum tonight, I'm actually coming to you live in front of a green screen at E2K Studios in Mountain View, California. This signal is being beamed to Dubai, where our partners at Three Monkeys are placing my image inside a virtual environment that will soon be populated by tonight's speakers. From there, the program is being streamed to the online platform you're watching tonight. Incredible. Now that I've arrived on our backstage set, it's my great pleasure to introduce my co-host for this evening's event. She is the founder and CEO of Duarte Inc., best-selling author, and also serves as a CHM trustee. Please welcome Nancy Duarte. Oh. Thanks, Daniel. I'm so thrilled to be with you as the museum honors Andy Van Dam as a 2021 fellow and tells the story of his work and impact in the world. Well, as someone who integrates visual design and words to tell stories at the highest level, you are the ideal co-host for tonight's program. So thank you for joining us, Nancy. That's sweet. Thanks. It's my pleasure, Daniel. And I would like to add a warm welcome to each of you who've joined us tonight. And you are also an important part in tonight's event. And here are four ways that you can participate in the program. You can add your comments to the live chat during the event. You can join the conversation on social media and use the hashtag CHMFellows. You can share your views through live polls that are going to be later in the program. And then after the event, take a moment to record a video message on our virtual event platform because we really want to hear your voice. Now we turn our focus to the 2021 Fellow Award recipient we have the privilege of honoring tonight. Do you watch animated movies or play video games? Do you click on digital links or images to see more? Uh, or do you puzzle over the ethical use of computer technology? If so, you can thank, in part, computer scientist and professor Andy Van Dam. Andy has played many roles over his five-decade career. He's an innovator and author, professor, mentor, and friend to so, so many. Let's learn about Andy's journey. I'm Andy Van Dam. My official Dutch name is Andries Van Dam. I was born in Groningen in the Netherlands in December 8, 1938. Andy's family moved to Indonesia when he was a baby. Soon, World War II broke out and his family was put in a Japanese concentration camp for nearly four years. All Dutch and other white nationals from other European countries were all sent to prison camps, concentration camps. We were fortunate enough 
to survive till the Japanese surrender. Andy's family was then repatriated to the Netherlands. And everyone else uh, went to the gas chambers. So with the benefit of hindsight, we were the lucky ones. In 1952, when Andy was 13, his family emigrated to the United States. Later, attending Swarthmore College, Andy met his future wife, Debbie, and hypertext visionary, Ted Nelson. Andy's master's thesis explored navigating information using aperture cards, a hybrid of computers and microfilm. Then he saw a film about Ivan Sutherland's groundbreaking computer graphics program, Sketchpad. That was life-changing, that realization that we didn't have to be in a punch card world, but that we could do things in real time, interactively. In the summer of 1965, Andy's wife, Debbie, was teaching high school French, and he wondered, could he teach kids computing? I loved it. I loved working with these kids. And I said, you know, maybe I want to go into teaching. He joined Brown's faculty because of its emphasis on teaching. And here at Brown, you have the chairman of the department in the middle of an interview saying, sorry, uh, I'll see you for lunch, but I gotta go teach freshmen. I thought, they mean it. McGraw-Hill called me up and said, we think graphics is an up and coming field as you clearly do. How'd you like a book contract? I met Jim. He agreed that we would write a book. Their book became the standard textbook for generations of computer graphics students. Over the next decade, Andy, with his students, built powerful graphic systems. We were in the hardware business. We wrote compilers, designed this systems language, and we wrote applications. They also helped kick off some of the first graphic standards. In 1967, Andy reconnected with Ted Nelson, who had a vision he called Xanadu, something like today's online world, plus more. Ted and I agreed that we should try to build a hypertext system and play around with this idea of hyperlinks and build a corpus, which today we would call a web. And so I asked some bright undergraduates if they'd like to work on that project, and they did. The Apollo Moon program even created documents with it. Then Andy had his next epiphany. I attended this session by Doug Engelbart and his crew had a mind-blowing experience. It, it's so head and shoulders above anything we had thought about, feeling I had been <laughs> outdistanced by miles, and then thinking about how I could steal the best ideas and combine them with things that we had learned from S and sort of be picking and choosing pieces of both systems that appeal and that I thought would be great to have. So that's what Fress is, it's an amalgam. When the English department used Fress to teach poetry in the mid-1970s, the results helped kick off the use of computing in the humanities, a revolutionary concept. Andy and colleague Bob Sedgwick filled a classroom with Apollo graphical workstations and later helped students have their own Macs. Andy, former student Norm Ryrowitz, and Bill Shipp co-founded an institute to bring cutting-edge hypertext to scholars in every discipline using Ryrowitz's program, Intermedia. Since the 1980s, Andy and his students have been involved in startup companies, virtual reality, web standards, and more. Now, Andy and his students are developing Dash, a browser-based hypermedia system that draws on all he has learned. I wouldn't have made it through this course without the help of the TAs. I started working with undergraduates as TAs, a radical notion at the time. Championing women and others, Andy has mentored thousands of students, many of whom have gone on to make major contributions themselves. Today, Andy is thinking about how to make sure technology benefits society. We have to try to ensure in the best possible way that the technology that we create and market uh, be as inclusive and as socially beneficial to society as we can make it. Wow, what an incredible life story. It is amazing to see how Andy has revolutionized, revolutionized the way people and computers connect in a way that is so good for humanity. 
Now it's time to welcome our first special guest. With us to deepen our understanding of Andy's worldview is computer scientist, hypermedia executive, adjunct professor, and longtime co-teacher with Andy at Brown University, Norm Myrowitz. Thanks, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be here to honor Andy. Uh, I've been working with Andy for more than 44 years uh, since he reeled me in my freshman week. If I had to sum up Andy's principles, it would be teaching is the noblest profession. Research isn't in and of itself, but it's a fantastic way of teaching that we can always push further. And like the old Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland movies, hey gang, let's put on a show. So in Andy's main interests have always been information, creativity, ubiquity, ease of use, and social responsibility. In terms of information, Andy's been uh, a pioneer in hypertext and hypermedia. He believes people should be active participants, not passive recipients of information. He bumped into Ted Nelson and um, Ted told him about his notion of hypertext and Andy was captivated and together they built one of the first hypertext edit systems called the hypertext editing system. In 1968, Andy saw Doug Engelbart's mother of all demos and was blown away and came back and built Fress, which coupled hypertext with document processing capabilities, um, one of the first almost WYSIWYG editors. In terms of creativity, Andy has always pushed 2D graphics and 3D graphics. Um, 3D graphics in some of the earliest days when it took three hours to create one firm frame of animation, but some of the undergraduates who did that went on to build the tools that Pixar uses to create their movies and to build um, award-winning, Academy Award-winning animation like the movie Babe. Um, in terms of ubiquity, Andy has always thought that computers would be everywhere, believing in Alan Kay's Dynabook uh, vision of laptops. Um, he and Raj Reddy and others pushed manufacturers to build 3M machines, a megapixel, a megabyte, and um, uh, a million instructions per second. Um, and when Steve Jobs visited many months before the Macintosh came out and showed it to us, um, Steve thought everybody would um, be drooling at the end. Uh, and Andy went up to him and said, yeah, Steve, that was great. And in the... Um, we can push further uh, mode. And he said, that would be great, but where's the networking? And you can imagine how Steve took that. Um, in terms of ease of use, Andy um, has been doing touch and pen computing um, since the 60s and believes that uh, pointing as a modality is important, especially for people who are creative and not computer scientists who wanna to use touch to um, navigate and explore. Finally, Andy's been into social responsibility um, in terms of inclusion um, from the earliest days, anyone who wanted to join his project, the more the merrier. And women were um, running technology projects right from the beginning. And Andy also thinks that um, he should teach all of his undergraduates, not just the joys of computing, but some of the social ills that can happen when computing is used improperly. So um, it's been fun to work with Andy and it's been fun to honor him and to help put on this show. Wow, Norm, after hearing your tribute, I'm tempted to come and listen in on the classes you're both teaching this fall. Thank you for a perspective that only you could have provided. So now we have a unique opportunity to hear from Andy himself. And joining him on our stage for an intimate conversation is a distinguished professor and leader in the Computing Science Department, University of Washington, a former student, longtime colleague, and friend of Andy, Ed Lazowska. Andy and Ed, welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Nancy. Andy, uh, I want to begin just by saying how honored I am to uh, have been invited to have a chat with you this evening. It's uh, a high point for me. We've known each other for 
gosh, more than 50 years, which is a bit scary. And uh, you're such a good friend and such a good mentor for so long. The documentary and Norm's tribute were really uh, comprehensive. And what I'd like to do in the next 25 minutes is delve in a bit more detail into three things. Uh, the first is, as I've known you over the years, I realized that your uh, birth in the Netherlands, your early childhood, your trip to Indonesia and back, uh, had a, a real impact on shaping you and your view of the world and uh, your sensitivity to so many issues. And it's also a part of history that uh, I knew very little about until you and I discussed it over the years. And I suspect many of our uh, guests here tonight also are uh, not familiar with it in detail, certainly not in the detail that uh, you who lived it are. So I'd like to spend a bit more time on that. Uh, Secondly, a bit more on how you found your way into interactive computer graphics and hypermedia systems. And uh, third, uh, how'd you develop your amazing commitment to uh, mentoring undergrads? And uh, you know, I experienced all of that, as did Norm, as did hundreds and thousands of others so in the classroom as teaching assistants, as research assistants. And after each of these three segments, we'll have a, a brief tribute. So let's start with your experience as a child. In uh, 1939, you were a year old and your family moved you to Indonesia. What was the uh, reason for that? Was it a concern about the uh, German advances in uh, Europe? Actually, no. It was because my dad had the previous year gotten his PhD in marine physiology and he got a really good opportunity to work at a marine biology lab in Java, which at the time was a Dutch colony, the Dutch East Indies, it was called. And uh, in 39, most people still did not believe that the Germans would actually carry out a second world war. Wow. So war hadn't broken out. What uh, happened when it did? Well, uh, first in 1940, as you remember, Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the Axis Alliance and they, between them, wanted to carve up the world, in fact, the Japanese overran much of Southeast Asia. They had started earlier in China and India, but they, for example, went all through Indonesia and set up concentration camps where they split the men and boys off into work camps and women and small children were in other concentration camps. So you were with your mother and sister in a concentration camp for three years and then what happened? Actually, my sister was born after the war, but never mind. I was with her and we were liberated uh, sometime after the Japanese surrender in 45 by the Brits in early 64. So we wanted to repatriate at that point, but Western Europe was completely devastated. Holland couldn't accommodate us and there was a very severe shortage of shipping. So we wound up spending six months in a kind of halfway camp, a DP camp in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. And then you were repatriated, is that right, at the end of that? Yeah, so we went back to Holland where for the first time I learned to wear not short pants, uh, wooden <laughs> shoes, had to learn to run in them, bitter cold winters, no central heating. We had one stove per burning beet bricks, which was the cheapest fuel. In any case, I had a very good elementary school uh, education. I took the seventh grade placement exams, got into a good school, was just barely through my first year in seventh grade when we uprooted yet again and went to the US. And that was to Falmouth uh, near Woods Hole. So presumably oceanography was connected here, marine biology. Yeah, exactly so. My dad had sensed that there wasn't enough opportunity for him to be a researcher. He wanted a better future for his kids. And he was very lucky to land this job at the Woods Hole Oceanographic right in his field. Wow. OK, let's uh, pause for a minute for a message from a special guest. Uh, he's a 3D computer graphics pioneer, uh, the co-founder of Pixar Animation Studios, where he served as president for 33 years. Uh, during that time, he also served as uh, president of Walt Disney Animation Studios, founder of three computer graphics research centers, uh, winner of the Turing Award, architect of Renderman, winner of multiple Academy Awards, 
Uh, and in 2013, he became a fellow of the Computer History Museum. So let's hear from your friend, Ed Catmull. Thanks, Ed. Andy, uh, it is so amazing that you're getting this award. I am so delighted to hear this. Over the years, your friendship has meant a great deal to me. Um, I know we've worked with uh, your students, of which you've produced a large number, who've had a profound effect on uh, making us and making Pixar. But you've had a profound effect on helping create the SIGGRAPH community. And uh, it's very dear to my heart that that happened. And uh, a lot of that is due to you and your leadership and all that you've added over the years. And I cherish and value what you've done and your friendships. And I congratulate you in this recognition. Uh, very nice. Thank you so much, Ed. Good to see you again. Uh, Andy, we'll get to computer graphics in a minute, I promise. But uh, just a okay. bit more about your travels before we get going. Uh, you attended most of middle school and high school in uh, Falmouth, and then your family the Philadelphia area, and you did your senior year there, and then what? Well, after we were uprooted again, I was fortunate to attend my senior year at Swarthmore High. And when it came time to pick out a good college, I asked my classmates and they said, oh, just up the hill, Swarthmore College. So I said, okay. I applied, fortunately got in, never bothered to, because nobody had told me you should do that. So uh, I was really yet again experiencing what I called the happenstances where I lucked out and lucked into opportunities. Amazing. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the path to computer science. Well, uh, in high school at Swarthmore, I really loved my physics course. 20th century was arguably the century of physics. And so I was going to become a nuclear physicist specializing in fusion. Unfortunately, reality got in the way. I took a freshman physics course, did very poorly. And the professor took me aside and he said, you better find another major. You're never going to be a physicist. So it took me a little while to get something else, uh, which turned out to be engineering sciences. And I wound up. Therefore, deciding I was going to be a transistor circuit designer. And a really good place to do that was the nearby Moore School of Electrical Engineering. Andy, we've lost your uh, video and now your audio. Okay, hang mm -hmm. on. Uh, it's on here. Ed, nod your head if you can. Am I back? You are. Is my, 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 yes. Is my Good. audio back? Is my audio back? Yes, it is. And you know, this is very good because when I was an undergraduate, you would scream bloody murder when something like that happened. So it's just really pleasant to see how things have evolved over the years. <laughs> I've become more mellow, Ed, believe it or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was at the University of Pennsylvania taking electromagnetism courses and other stuff that EEs had to know. And then my, uh, my office mate, Dick Wexelblatt, said there's this new course that sounds interesting on automata theory and digital computers. And I said, what's a digital computer? I programmed analog computers by wiring them and never heard of digital computers. So I thought, sure, let's check it out. And then when I really liked that course, it so happened that uh, the university and the Moore School started a new program in computer and information sciences. And I thought, okay, let's try that out. I re really liked the information in information sciences because ultimately to me, computers have really always been a means to an end. I have to say my path to computer science was a lot like yours, except my physics professor second semester didn't pull me aside. He just gave me a D and that was uh, my path, my path to you. Okay, but so you, you left broke Penn. the code. Yeah, right. <laughs> you left Penn and you moved to Brown uh, a couple of years before you finished your thesis. How did that happen? 
I wasn't that happy in grad school for a variety of reasons and I was restless. So I did some uh, job interviewing and I just about accepted the assistant professorship at Maryland when I got a call from a kid that I had taught when he was still in high school and I ran a summer program for high school students and their students for fun. And he called up being uh, applied mathematicians at Brown and said, hey, the division wants to hire somebody who knows something about computer science, and this is the school for you. It's like Swarthmore. They really believe in undergraduates. I was a little hesitant, but I took him up on it and interviewed for a day. I knew that Brown had been an early user of computation for science and engineering, and I learned very quickly about this emphasis on undergraduates, as the intro video said, in the middle of an interview, unthinkable. The chairman said, uh, gotta go teach a freshman course. I'll see you wow. at lunch. So that was in uh, 1965. Uh, today, you know, computer science is kind of the obvious natural thing to do. It uh, surely wasn't back then. What was acceptance like? You were the computer oh. science in the division of applied mathematics, right? Well, computers were for number crunching. And we were rebels. We were a counterculture that didn't get much respect from the more traditional disciplines. So we scrapped for a lot of things. I remember distinctly when one of my senior colleagues at one point said, computer science, eh, it's just so much bathroom thinking. And I thought, <laughs> wow, it's a good thing we have tenure. <laughs> Anyhow, I never foresaw this exponential growth of computing and of computer science as a major, unthinkable back then. Okay, and among the uh, numerical folks, if computer science was bathroom thinking, then interactive graphics must have been uh, uh, even more of an outlier. I know that uh, yeah. Sketchpad got you hooked on graphics, but when did you get your first display and what did you do with it? My second year, we got a wonderful IBM 2250 vector display, which was a peripheral to the mainframe, which as you remember was a 360 mod 50 doing, oh wow, 150, kilo instructions per second, and it had half a megabyte of memory. Wow, we were flying high. I also got a grant from uh, IBM New York Scientific Center. Sam Matz was the director, and we were supposed to do CAD on this beautiful display. My first two graduate students, Charles Strauss and Jim Michener, did in fact do CAD-oriented dissertation, and Charlie uh, built this 3D interactive stereographics display by using a stereopticon that did left right eye separation in front of the display. Got it. So to add to our conversation, we have a, a tribute now from one of your former students, a 1976 Brown graduate who uh, spent a dozen years at SRI, Apple, Analytical, and uh, Borland, and then was recruited by Bill Gates to uh, lead the Windows 95 effort for Microsoft. Spent a decade at Microsoft in a variety of roles and left to co-found venture capital firms, Ignition Partners and Fuel Capital. Welcome, Brad Silverberg. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for having me here tonight. It's a real honor to speak on behalf of Andy uh, and this incredible honor that Andy is receiving. Now, I came to Brown a little over 50 years ago as a political science major, thinking I'd never take another math science course the rest of my life. But for some unknown reason, I decided to take an introduction to computer languages course freshman year. And after struggling for a little bit, I found I really loved it. So I took second year Andy's course, Applied Mathematics 101, which was had a reputation for being a really hard course, one to weed out uh, prospective majors from those who are really committed. And I worked my butt off. Andy was, uh, he was a demanding teacher but he was always fair and he inspired me, he challenged me, but most of all, he believed in me. I would start from a little behind and uh, Andy's belief in me really created a love for computer science and he created a sense of community in the department that really touched all of us. We were on a new frontier, we were exploring new worlds, doing groundbreaking work. Andy literally wrote the book, on computer graphics. He did groundbreaking work on hypertext. It was 
being part of that as an undergraduate was pretty remarkable. And that was something that Andy uniquely did. He was very one of the first to do that, was to involve undergraduates in things that normally had been reserved just for graduate students, whether it's doing undergraduate research or the undergraduate teaching assistant program. Um, we weren't really ready for that responsibility, but Andy believed in us and we grew tremendously as a result. And it had a huge impact on us. Uh, Andy brings out a sense of tremendous loyalty in people. And I think a good measure of that was how a couple of years ago, uh, Norm and a few others of us decided to raise an endowed chair in Andy's name. And because of how much Andy has touched people, we were able to raise that $4 million in just a matter of weeks. It was really beautiful. That was a real tribute to the impact that Andy has had on people. And not only impact on people in general, but the impact on me personally. I would say, Andy, that you've had more impact on my life, changed the course of my life more than any other person, including my own parents. And for that, Andy, thank you very much. Thank you for this honor. Uh, congratulations on the honor. And I love you. Brad, that's uh, a wonderful from the heart description of how Andy changed the course of your life uh, wow. as he did mine and so many others for sure. Just incredible. Um, and uh, I just want to say, imagine how different the course of Microsoft and personal computing would have been if it weren't for uh, your presence. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Andy, we have to clip along here a little bit, but uh, you continued doing graphics for many years. How did you get the hypertext bug? I know that uh, obviously you reacquainted with Ted Nelson, but uh, take it from there. Yeah, so another happenstance. Just happened to run into Ted at a conference in 67, and we chatted about what we'd all been up to. I told him I was in the graphics business, and he said he'd been working on a hypertext idea, explained it to me, and uh, as Norm said, let's put on a show. Uh, we decided that we would implement at least a portion of his vision on my graphics display. And of course, we had to size it to the mainframes of the day, many, many orders of magnitude less powerful than what we have today. And we got to use the IBM mainframe uh, between midnight and 6 a.m., sometimes for several hours at a time as our own personal computer. It was kind of like a time machine. We knew what we would want eventually, and it would just run more slowly than it would in the distant future. But we knew that what we wanted was what you see is what you get document editing, and we wanted hyperlinks. So I'm proud that the first author on the hypertext paper that we published with Ted and uh, one other person, uh, that Steve Carmody, then just a junior, was the first author. So I've had many wonderful graduate students but my real passion, as you've heard already, and what attracted me to Brown was the undergraduates. And that's sort of when I entered. I was a hypertext editing system user and a developer of the successor system. I know you set out to redesign it to support multiple users, multiple terminal types, 300 baud modems, absolutely unbelievable. Um, you saw Engelbart's yeah. mother of all demos and scrapped everything and started again. And uh, Again, I was just coding this away in assembly language at the time. Uh, you talked in the uh, uh, documentary about the uh, English poetry course. Why don't you say a little more about that? Because I think, you know, I was, uh, at the time I was working on uh, the successor system, uh, we were the users, but that course was an example of a real user. Yeah. So what happened was I got to know Bob Scholes, who was a semiotician, spun off the media modern culture department at Brown. And he was interested in having kids get a deeper understanding of poetry and write more about that poetry to be more expressive. So he and his graduate students spent an entire summer cutting and pasting poetry from all kinds of sources, mostly English poetry, and figuring out where the links should be between poems on the similar subject poems by the same poet, of course, 
and importantly, scholarly discussions, critiques of the poems. And then the idea was let the students start enriching this initial corpus with their commentary, their interpretations, the TAs reacting to their commentary, they reacting to each other's commentary, and it would all just keep building the hypertext. So to me, this was the first online scholarly community and the first building of a communal text. And it was a serious experiment to us. We had control groups and our group not only had fewer cavities, but they wrote three times as much. And that was a huge success for Bob. Wow. Okay, so moving on, you did later work on virtual reality, scientific visualization, lots of work in tablet computing in the past decade. Uh, give us a quick view of how that happened. More happenstance, ran into a guy named Steve Bryson, was a nice NASA scientist at a conference, and he told me about the potential of VRs he saw, it, and fortunately funded the project and some early equipment. And continuing to work for him, we then also, through an equipment grant, Brown got a very fancy instrument called a cave, also virtual reality. And that cave has still a really good existence at Brown. Also, kind of in parallel, I had a long-term engagement with Microsoft, particularly in the area of tablets, which they started incubating in the early 2000s. And my PhD student, Joe Laviola, who's now a full professor at USC, uh, talked me into doing something in 2D, whereas we had been working in virtual reality. It was called MathPad, and it let you sketch two-dimensional mathematics expressions, which would then be compiled, executed, graphed. And there was also a little animation model, very much along the lines of what Alan Kay predicted for the Dynabook, so that you had really interactive visualizations. And so my group did a, a lot of work, and we still do, on gesture recognition, both on little tablets, all the way up to 84 inch displays. Great, let's uh, move to our final tribute. Uh, we're gonna hear from one of your PhD alums who went on to spend 18 years at Schlumberger Digital Equipment Corporation and then as a director at Bell Labs, eight years as a professor at uh, Uppsala University and uh, now is the founder of Tedes AI, uh, a company focused on uh, AI-based decision support for prostate cancer treatment. Let's welcome Ingrid Karlbaum. Ingrid? Thank you, Ed. I joined Brown University and Andy's research group in 1971. That was the same year when the sister college Pembroke was merged with Brown University to form a co-educational institution. And only 25% of the student body was female. When I met Andy, uh, I encountered a professor like no other I'd encountered before. I walked into his office and politely said, excuse me, are you Professor Van Damme? And he snapped, what is the professor nonsense? Or something to that effect. Andy's research group was an oasis in the traditional male-oriented hierarchical university environment. He led from the center and everybody was welcome. He treated his students as valued colleagues and that rubbed off on the students. We, by and large, treated each other with the same collegiality. So it's not surprising that many women joined Andy's research group. I spoke to several of them before this tribute, and they have gone on to have great careers in industry and academia, and they all credit Andy with having them given a good start on their careers. Andy drove his students to excel by expecting that they could and would perform much better than they thought themselves that they were capable of. I've told the following story many times, but uh, it warrants retelling because it really illustrates what it was like to work with Andy. Andy called me into his office and said, I want you to come with me to a graphic standards meeting. I want you to sit in the back and listen and learn. These people have thought a lot about the problem and uh, so don't speak. Well, 
seen but not heard was something I grew up with, so I knew how to do that. A few weeks later, Andy handed me a stack of papers, <clears throat> which um, what were the notes from the meeting, and said, look at these and tell me what you think. I read them and told Andy was not at all what had been agreed upon. So he said, call them and uh, let them know what you think. After this, I became the de facto editor of the graphic standard. And um, in 1977, when the standard was presented at SIGGRAPH, I was there and I received a lot of credit for my work. Andy, I'm very proud to have been part of the journey that has taken you to um, this great, well-deserved award that we are celebrating today. Thank you for being my mentor. Thank you for being my friend and congratulations. Ingrid, it's uh, wonderful to hear your reflections on the impact Andy had on your life, uh, particularly as a woman in computer science. Andy, we've left out a lot and we are past our time limit. Uh, we've left out a lot, you know, you've built special purpose graphics, hardware and all sorts of things like that. Let me close with one final quick question. You've had a career full of technical achievements. What are you most proud of? Well, you set me up for this. It's the students, of course. I'm hugely proud of students, graduate students like Ingrid. By the way, she minimized her role. She wrote a critical section on 3D viewing that went into the book and that people still use to this day. So she wasn't uh, just a support person. She contributed hugely intellectually. So yes, I'm very proud of my PhD students, but it's mostly about the, the hundreds of undergraduate TAs and RAs like you, like Norm, like Brad, and the remarkable careers that they have had. Now, despite its emphasis on undergraduates at Brown, I found that in the beginning, as you already uh, hinted at, um, they, this idea was kind of looked at askance, but I persisted in doing it. Eventually it came to be recognized as a good thing to do. And I learned by doing it that if you throw kids in the deep end of the pool, you trust that they will learn to swim. You put responsibility on their shoulders. They rise to it. They do learn to swim. And then they wind up doing more than you and they think they can do. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful thought to end on. Uh, Andy Van Dam, friend, uh, mentor, hero. Thank you for this chat this evening. And again, congratulations. And thanks so much. So while I'm thanking. Andy. Hey, Andy, Ed, it was so amazing to hear you interact as longtime colleagues and super close friends. So thank you for your illuminating conversation. So right now, we're going to take a short flight over to our main stage to begin our award presentation. Thanks, Nancy. For over three decades, CHM's fellow awards have recognized technology pioneers, legends and unsung heroes who've advanced the field of computing and propelled humanity forward. The first fellow was Grace Murray Hopper, a trailblazer in software programming. Since Grace, CHM has presented this prestigious award to 90 fellows, including many who are in the audience tonight. Truly, these distinguished fellows have changed our world. Here to present the 2021 Fellow Award to Andy Van Dam is John Crawford. A student of Andy's, John developed software tools for the Intel 8086 processor and then transitioned into a role as Intel's microprocessor architect for the first 386 and then a number of subsequent processors during his 35-year career as a software engineer and computer architect at Intel. John holds 51 patents, 
For his seminal work on industry standard microprocessor architectures, John was honored as a CHM fellow in 2014. John Crawford. You're gonna go first. There we go. Thank you, Daniel. I'm honored to be a fellow of the Computer History Museum. The CHM Fellow Award is a special accolade considered one of the highest marks of achievement in the computing field. As a fellow, I feel privileged to present this prestigious award to Andy here tonight. I first met Andy Van Dam as, a, as an undergrad student at Brown in the spring of 1972, and that's coming up on 50 years ago. I had arrived at Brown the previous semester as an underachieving teenager. A math uh, study buddy encouraged me to make a late course change for that second semester of my freshman year to take Applied Math 44, Introduction to Computer Science. It didn't take long for me to become hooked and commit to a computer science major. Andy's CS program gave me an intellectual challenge to excel against. It was a lot of work, but the work was carefully directed and supported to develop knowledge in many areas of computer science. Andy is best known for his seminal contributions to computer graphics and human computer interaction, but I benefited from the broad reach of his scholarship and also his talent for extracting grant money. In my junior year, I was hired as a research assistant on a compiler project. I was to build the symbol table for the Language for System Development Compiler, also known as LSD. Yes, it was the 70s. This gave me some valuable experience that provided a firm foundation in machine level programming, compiler construction, and the software hardware interface. This provided a strong base that later grew into a career in software development and then computer architecture at Intel. Andy not only built an outstanding academic computer science department at Brown, he also directed a lot of his legendary energy into advising his students. He helped me with course selection, grad school and job references, and he exercised his connection with Jim Foley, then at University of North Carolina, to recommend an, a research assistant position for me to pursue a terminal master's degree there. That's the highlights of my history with Andy. I'm sure there are thousands of similar stories from lives that Andy has influenced. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome back Andy. Hi, Andy. John, that was lovely, thank you. Your ongoing work has advanced computing and impacted so many people that it's very fitting for you to be named a Computer History Museum Fellow. So here we go with a formal award presentation. Andries Van Dam, on behalf of the Computer History Museum, it is my distinct honor to present to you the 2021 Fellow Award for your lifetime of contributions to computer graphics, hypertext, and education. And there we have the magic of moving pixels. Thank you so very much, John and Norm, Ed, Brad, Ingrid, and all the friends who recorded videos for those really lovely, if uh, I have to say somewhat rose-colored tributes. And I'm still waiting to hear what Dave S. is going to say. Now, when I told my wife the good news that I had been elected to this pantheon of the computer age, her immediate response was, wow, you finally become a museum piece. Well, it's such an exceptional and humbling honor for me to be so, to become a fellow, and it's really a special joy to do it in the same year that my dear friend Raj Reddy has that great honor as a 2021 fellow. There are many, many people I want to thank, starting of course with Dana Lewin, the selection committee for recognizing me with this superb award, and with this amazing production. My gratitude therefore to the people who created it, Kirsten, Marguerite, John, Michael, and their crews. And then a very special thanks to the ever patient Mark Weber, who's not just a Brown grad, but who interviewed me three times over three decades for his amazing oral history. I also really want to acknowledge some close friends colleagues that I've looked up to 
and learn from over the years, each in his own way, a role model of invention, of impact and of humanity, particularly Ed Catmull, Raj Reddy, Don Greenberg, Henry Fuchs, my Brown colleague, Spike Hughes, and Bill Buxton. And a special thanks to my brother, Jim Foley, for being such a great partner and pioneer in human computer interaction. Now, above all, my heartfelt thanks to my wonderful family, my beloved wife of more than 60 years, Debbie, and our three daughters, Elisa, Lori, and Catherine. They often bore the brunt of very long hours and long absences, and not just supported me, but put up with me as I focused on my work. I don't think I ever got the work-life balance thing properly worked out. Now, the persons who inspired me most, particularly when I was growing up, were my father and mother, who not only instilled the work ethic in me, but more importantly, taught me by example what real perseverance looks like in the face of unfathomable trauma, heartache, and hardship. My father's motto till the day he died at age 102, strive to optimize. So life, as they say, is a journey, but is often not a planned one. The major theme of my personal story, as you've already heard, is the outsized role of happenstance, pure luck. As Raj Reddy said during his acceptance speech, we were fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. Now you heard about my first happenstance, which was the traumatic internment. After that, things improved dramatically, especially when we were able to immigrate to the US. But I had no grand plan. When I was young, my plan was basically seeing where the road would take me. All I knew for sure is that I wanted to be a scientist like my dad, but not exactly like my dad, certainly not marine biology, too damn much memorization. And being a teacher, no, that wasn't in the cards at all. Now, most career advice that I give to young people is follow your passion. But even in the beginning of grad school, I wasn't at all sure I'd found it. But then I got lucky again, as I mentioned, to find computer science, then interactive computer graphics, and then my career in the noblest profession, one that lets me continue to have my vocation and my avocation be one and the same to this day. I am privileged to the max. Another huge stroke of luck was getting hired by Brown. I always wanted to do things my way and Brown pretty much let me have a free hand both in the research topics and in the kinds of courses I wanted to teach and how I wanted to teach them. And the most controversial thing as you heard was having undergraduates act as teaching assistants, taking on all the rules of graduate TAs, but because they had taken that same course the previous year, had more empathy, uh, more knowledge of the assignments, and they knew what the struggles were all about. Not coincidentally, for me at least, they were an order of magnitude cheaper and in much greater supply than graduate students would have been. So the major thread through my entire career has been the pervasive use, indeed, I would say reliance on undergraduates, not just in teaching, but also in research. I've never taught a course, nor honshoed a research project where I didn't actively use undergraduates. And in fact, many of the ideas, both courses and projects came from the undergraduates. Among the many, many students from whom I learned more than they possibly could have learned from me and whom I still consider as part of my extended family, our dear friends that you heard from already today, but also many others, including CMU's unforgettable Randy Pausch, Columbia's Steve Finer, University of Minnesota's law professor, not CS, Carol Chomsky, and Google Research's David Salison. Sadly, one of my very first Brown students dating from my first year, 65, Bob Monk passed away just last year. He became my friend, colleague, led equally brilliant undergraduates like Ed in invent inventing well beyond the state of the art and co-taught courses with me and his own courses for a number of years. 
So switching topics, let me preview an upcoming segment. As you heard that over the last decade, I've become increasingly concerned with what's now called socially responsible computing or computing for the social good. Therefore, I was delighted to hear that CHM included a world-class panel on this important topic, including one of my most accomplished former students and dear friend, Dana Boyd. Now, for the younger generations, I'd like to conclude by sharing what I tell my advisees during freshman week. As you heard, my life has been a bunch of zigzags. My plans never materialized the way I thought they would, and I rolled with it. When I saw something that I thought was better than what I'd seen before, well, I went that way without being stuck. So be open, be opportunistic in exactly the right way. Recognize that unlike me, you're gonna have a dozen jobs, if not careers, before you retire. Indeed, if you retire, and have a blast exploring. Now, folks, this event has been truly an amazing experience, one I never imagined any more than I imagined the giant leaps and strides that our field has made, starting with batch computing to today's online world. Becoming a fellow and having this incredible production in my honor is fabulous. Again, my grateful thanks to the CHM and its super people. Congratulations, Andy. I'm so honored to be the very first person to congratulate you as our newest fellow at CHM. Building on Andy's contribution to the history of computing, we will now turn our focus to digital technologies of today, especially graphics for their innovation, application, and impact. Here to share the story of Andy's impact on his life and in turn his impact on others is a former TA of Andy's. He's an Adobe Fellow, an Academy Award winner for the impact that After Effects has had on the film industry and an Emmy Award winner for the impact that Adobe's character animation tool has had on broadcast. Please welcome Dave S. Congratulations to Andy for receiving the Computer History Museum's Fellow Award. And thank you to the museum for this opportunity to share stories about Andy and his impact on me, the graphics industry, and the world at large. Andy was already a legendary professor in the computer science department at Brown University when I started there in 1986. I first got to know Andy as a teaching assistant for CS11, the introductory computer science class. TAing for Andy is not just a regular TA job. TAs for Andy also write and participate in educational skits. As the humor TA, one of my jobs was to extend the decades-long tradition of delivering a drink for Andy in a different way at the start of each class. This ranged from a simple bottle of water to a hollow pumpkin billowing dry ice vapor to a bottle of baby shampoo filled with apple juice, as another former TA recalled on the I Know Andy Van Dam Facebook group. The skits, while flamboyant, are not frivolous. Besides entertainment, they serve a larger purpose of bonding the TAs to each other and to the students. Andy has always been thoughtful about the community he creates, employing a diverse range of TAs to encourage balanced representation in computer science, especially for women. Andy connects with you, hard, literally. He's known for rib-crushing hugs. To further the connection, every year, he and his wife, Debbie, invite the TAs over for a delectable dinner. If Andy is involved, the food is sure to be top-notch. Eating out with Andy at his usual haunts often elicits a visit by the chef. There's a Japanese word for when the chef gets free reign to make your meal, omakase. Whenever possible, that's how Andy rolls. It's a nice parallel to how he treats his TAs. Give them power and trust them to do great things. I enjoyed working for Andy so much that I signed up to TA CS11 again the following year, and then, for my senior year, got the coveted slash feared head TA job, along with David Herbsman and Sarah Allen. The job was extremely challenging, but with Andy's trust in us, we rose to that challenge. When you become head TA, the previous year's leaders passed down the head TA missive with details on how to run the class, along with helpful tidbits about working with Andy, including his four commandments. Thou shalt not power trip. Thou shalt not flake. Thou shalt be proactive, and thou shalt not assume. 
he usually followed that last one with the old adage of, when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Andy co-wrote the world standard computer science textbook called Computer Graphics, Principles and Practice. When I asked a group of Adobe principal scientists about who had been influenced by Andy, I received a flood of responses, many noting that the book was currently within arm's reach or visible just a few steps away, as it has been for me for three decades. Bringing it back to my co-head TAs, after graduation in the spring of 1990, Dave H. and I founded a company with two other Brown grads, and Sarah joined us soon thereafter. We wanted to become a hypermedia publishing conglomerate using everything we learned from Andy about hypertext. Two years later, in our last ditch effort to save the founder and company, we created a visual effects and motion graphics application called After Effects to ride what looked like a promising new wave of video production migrating to desktop computers. Skills learned in Andy's CS224 computer graphics class paved the way. We shipped version 1.0 in January 93 and found immediate success. After an acquisition by Aldous Corporation later that year and a merger with Adobe Systems in 94, it continued on as Adobe After Effects, which is still the leading motion graphics tool today. After Effects would not have existed without Andy's role in gathering and training us. In addition to Sarah, Dave H., and me, many other Andy-trained developers have worked on After Effects, including Dan Wilk, Michael Natkin, Scott Snibby, and Dave Sklar. If you follow the thread of Andy's influence to the next level, the countless projects that have been created using After Effects are inescapable if you watch TV or movies. Add in Sarah's role in creating Flash's RTMP video streaming on the web. Then add in Andy's impact on Pixar and include all of their audiences. It's not possible to enumerate all the examples of Andy's students changing the world, but it's fair to say that Andy has impacted the vast majority of humans on this planet. Even the After Effects rendered motion graphics that the Computer History Museum produced for this event were possible because of Andy. Before I finish up, I'll just note that it did cross my mind that, as the missive warned, I shouldn't assume that Andy will like this tribute. But to keep it a surprise for him, he is seeing it right now for the first time. One thing I can count on, if he doesn't like it, he'll tell me. Honoring Andy as a Computer History Museum fellow feels exactly right to me. I can't think of anyone I know who has positively affected more people. Andy, thank you for everything you have done for me, for computer graphics, and for the world. Thank you, Dave S., for sharing your reflection, and those photos were amazing. It's great to consider this ripple effect that's emanating from Andy to literally millions of people around the globe. We are truly witnessing a creative explosion, and a lot of cutting edge work is now being done in virtual reality. So to demonstrate current computer graphic tools and show how they empower human creativity, we have asked two extraordinary artists to accept a little challenge. We asked them, can you create a new work of VR art in front of us tonight in just 20 minutes? Well, fortunately, Giovanni Nockpill and Estella Say both said sure, and they are both with us tonight. So first, let me introduce Giovanni. He is a senior design evangelist and creative director at Adobe. He has served a digital mo as a digital model supervisor at Industrial Light and Magic and a 3D artist at Valve and as an art director at Facebook. During his time in tech, Gio has pioneered emerging consumer products for the world of virtual reality. So please give a warm welcome to Giovanni Nockpill. <laughs> Next, I'm delighted to introduce Estella Tse. She is a virtual reality and augmented reality creative director and an artist and has been an artist in residence with Google, Adobe, Snapchat, Cartoon Network Studios. She integrates emerging technologies and visual storytelling into a new art form. Her work has been featured on Forbes, CNET, The Australian, among others. Welcome, Estella. Hello. <laughs> Gio, I see that you have a VR headset. You have your computer, and I know that is off stage. But can you share a bit about the tools that you're using tonight and the process, too? So I'll be using Adobe Medium for my uh, sculpture that I'll be demoing for you all. 
and then after that I'll be transporting the sculpture onto Adobe Substance Stager where I'll be integrating my virtual reality sculpture into reality with a photographic backdrop to make it look photoreal. So. So Estella, it looks like you have a little bit of a different VR headset. I'd love to hear about your process and tools. Today I'm going to be using Google's Tilt Brush. It's a virtual reality painting program. Um, so I'll be painting and sculpting in virtual reality. Um, and you'll see that in live action. I can't wait to see you work. So now it's time for me to reveal the design challenge. Here at CHM, our vision centers on building and harnessing technology to shape a better future for humanity. So this is your challenge. Create a new piece of art that brings this museum's vision to life. You're gonna have 20 minutes. So are you ready, set, go. Wow, you can see Gio's creating a, wow, it's a 3D sculpture. He's got like a head and now he's building out a body. Um, yeah, and we can, we can see on screen that Gio is, uh, what he's seeing in his headset, we can actually see that on screen right now. One more two. This is fascinating. Now let's go over and see what Estella is up to. So cool. You can see that she's painting in the air with tilt brush. Wow. It's so fun to see what they see uh, through their VR headsets. It's like seeing a moving their heads, their hands, their body. It's almost like performing art. So while Gio and Estella continue to work, we're going to shift gears to explore one last topic that has been and continues to be very important to Andy, and that's ethics and computing. And to lay the groundwork for this discussion, I want to turn it back to Daniel, but don't worry. We're going to come back to Gio and Estella to see their final works of art. Well, thanks, Nancy. I can't wait to see the artist's representation of our CHM vision. As we consider how technology can help shape a better future, there are thorny issues to navigate and challenging choices to make in our own lives and for our organizations. How do we deal with privacy? monetization of our data, misinformation, disinformation, and more. These are the issues that Andy has been raising in his classes for years. Recently, see, he has extended what he calls a call to arms to address the negative impacts of technology on society. And with us this evening to further explore Andy's call to arms, to share their views on the most pressing issues for tech and society, are Eric Horowitz and Dana Boyd with moderator James Manika. Eric Horowitz serves as Microsoft's first chief scientific officer, where he provides leadership and perspectives on issues and opportunities at the intersection of technology, people, and society. He currently serves as a commissioner for the National Security Commission on AI and chairs the line of effort on ethical and responsible AI. In turn, Dana Boyd is a partner at Microsoft Research and the founder and president of Data and Society. She's a visiting professor 
at New York University and focuses on addressing social and cultural inequities by understanding the relationship between technology and society. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a director of the Social Science Council. She was also one of Andy's students. So to lead this discussion, we're in really good hands with James Manyika. James is a senior partner at McKinsey and Company and chairman and director of the McKinsey Global Institute. He's authored books and articles and worked with companies on issues related to innovation, the digital economy, and the future of work. He serves and has served, excuse me, in the Obama administration and was appointed to Governor Newsom's co-chair, the Future of Work Commission for the state of California. Take it away, James. Thank you very much, Dan. Dana and Eric, I'm delighted to be in conversation with you as we celebrate Andy today. Uh, by the way, congratulations, Andy. But let's dive, dive right in. When it comes to ethics and social responsible computing, what are the one or two top of mind issues for you and why? Let's start with you, Eric. Well, I share Andy, Andy's passion about harnessing the advances in computing to change the world for the better, but like Andy, I've also been concerned with the rough edges of computing applications on people in society. I'm particularly concerned about what I would call rough edges with uses of AI technologies. And these include both the inadvertent effects like amplifying societal biases and violating privacy, but also malevolent pursuits. So top of my list uh, are malevolent uses of AI. And these include AI powered persuasion and propaganda and the use of AI methods by authoritarian autocratic regimes to squash freedoms. On the AI powered persuasion and propaganda, I see AI methods being harnessed by malevolent actors to undermine the understandings that people have of events in the world. On this front, generative AI technologies are being combi combined with advances in graphics. These advances are descendants of the graphical methods uh, that Andy pioneered with his colleagues, but now they're being used to generate false impersonations and false realities. Such synthetic media, often called deep fakes, really do threaten the foundations of democracy. If not checked, these methods can carry us into what I've been calling a potential post-epistemic era where we can't distinguish reality from falsehoods. Now, beyond deep fakes, a related and synergistic concern is AI, are AI technologies being used by adversarial regimes to manipulate people? The unprecedented availability of data, telemetry, uh, and feedback uh, of the form that comes as a standard with commercial social media platforms, these can enable malevolent actors to do AI-powered psychological operations. And these kinds of psychological operations or campaigns can extend in time and be deeply personalized, aimed at persuading, shifting beliefs, having deep influences on individuals, on populations. These are AI powered cyber attacks on human cognition on the minds of people. Now I'm optimistic that we can apply computing methods to help address the challenge of deep fakes, including the use of new watermarking cryptographic methods to authenticate the source and history of media. We're also gonna need insightful regulations to bring laws to bear on false impersonation and the fabrication of events. Now, I'll just mention my second uh, key concern, and that's with AI methods being used by these authoritarian autocratic regimes for surveillance and inference about their citizens. These uses of AI can lead to unprecedented oppression, forms of tracking and control that are more concerning in many ways than the dystopian visions of George Orwell. Cameras can be pointed at town squares and stadiums and enable authorities to continue to analyze and recognize the whereabouts and activities of thousands of people. And specific individuals can be identified in large crowds. Multiple signals can be employed to do persistent monitoring and inference, providing new forms of what I would call precision triangulation about people's locations and actions. Thus, AI technology can be used by authoritarian regimes to further suppress freedoms, right. stifling assembly and, and, and expression. So coalitions of like-minded nations are gonna to have to come together to assert norms about how AI should not be used. Such efforts may one day lead to special extensions to international conventions, like the international human rights laws to address oppressive, unacceptable uses of computing technologies. 
Well, th those are two big ones, Eric, um, and uh, that's pretty dark stuff. But Dana, what do you think? I mean, you've been thinking about these issues too. What's top yeah, of mind for you? Well, I, it's funny. I've been thinking about these issues in many ways for 25 years. Um, when I got to walk in as a freshman uh, to be a student of Andes, and we've been able to have this conversation ongoing for decades, which is just a delight. So first, I just have to say congratulations, Andy. Um, you know, you have inspired so many people, so many people here, you know, telling stories. And and I just I hope that you're enjoying this this evening. And so it's fun to be on this panel to rehash some of these conversations that we've been having and think about how they extend. And I think this is where into you know, this question of where do we think of the major issues of ethics? You know, Eric you just gave us some pretty dark places. Um, and I think part of it is for me, I, I think of ethics as going more macro than that. Ethics is a contestation, a way of negotiating what we think of as important about the social world, what we care about, what we value. And it's about those moments of contestation. And what Eric has highlighted is the degree to which technology is a tool. And for a long time, technology was a play box. It was a place where we imagined we could have fun things and we wanted to focus on all the amazing things we could do and have this deterministic reality of like, if we just build it, cool things will happen. And, you know, Andy, in many ways, that's part of the fun that got you into all of this. I think one of the hardest parts about recognizing technology today is that technology has power. And when technology has power, the ethical issues come fast and furious, not because of technology, but because of any system of power. And that's why I think it's really important when we talk about this, that I think that the first critical ethical thinking is to remember that every technology has social cultural and political consequences. There's no way of avoiding it. There's no neutral technology. There's no apolitical technology. It is simply not possible. And therefore, when we think about ethics, we can't think about finding a way to avoid it in hopes that we can find a technology that won't get us into trouble. Every technology can backfire. And that's important because we can imagine all of the amazing and we can imagine all of the horrors, but part of the ethical thinking is to remember that this is part of a constant conversation. And to that second point, I think, you know, as, as Eric's pointing out, a lot of post-epistemic issues, I think it's a reminder that there is a humanistic component to this, that no technology can be designed purely with technologists. And that's one of the reasons why the ethics conversation is about getting people engaged. And so that's where I would say that the second issue that is an ethics issue is how to ensure that inequities are not based, baked into our systems, that they're not part of our organizations, that they're not part of our arrangement of power and money flows. We need to bring people to the table who are impacted by this. And that's critical to understand an ethical issue because without it, we are going to not be able to see certain things. And we're going to watch our tools go in places we never would have imagined. And those will be horrible to see and watch. Yeah, you're highlighting, Dana, the way uh, these kinds of issues play into our social, political, economic, and even organizational systems and the, uh, the issues related to power. You know, we, I, I'd like to find a way to bring uh, here from our audience uh, on these uh, what's top of mind for them too. And so we've listed some of some, not all of the ethical issues that typically come up, and we're keen to hear how our audience, uh, how our audience would pick the top of mind ones from the list that we're going to put in the uh, uh, in the chat and the screen. So if you want to cast your vote, please go to vote to the vote here button that's located at the top of the chat column. Uh, we'd like to see what our audience um, thinks, at least of the ones that we've uh, put in the in the list. Now, while, while the audience is doing that, I, I think bo both of you kind of alluded to the, the fact that we're going to have to think about what to do about this. I'd like to come back to that later. But I'm also curious about um, some of the other issues you didn't raise, such as uh, the ethical issues related to our economic systems, for example. You, you spoke mostly about uh, kind of bias and unfairness and justice and those kinds of issues. What about issues of uh, economic issues? Am I allowed to rant on late stage capitalism? That's usually a dangerous oh. thing to do. <laughs> you can jump in for a little bit, Dana, but I'd love to see what also, I may interrupt you just to hear what, I, what came back from our poll. Well, that's interesting. Before Actually, before you jump in, Dana, I see we've got the polling results up. That's interesting uh, to see what, what people think. So, Sounds like most people think of these issues of bias and inequity are probably at the top of the top of the list. That's interesting. 
And then Andy, uh, and then Eric, you raised the issues of disinformation uh, that also scored fairly high. But Dana, why don't you go ahead and say something about late stage capitalism as, a, as an ethical issue? It's always a dangerous thing to let me go on this hobby horse. But I think part of it is when we're, when we're talking about inequities, we're talking about systems that have been set up for centuries to ensure that there are people who have and people who have not. And in our current context, that is very much part of our arrangement of economic power. And this is one of these interesting tricks to watch like coming from the tech industry. When, you know, when I was growing up, when, you know, as a student of Andy's, we were just like, we were the geeks, we were the outsiders, like people who wanted to make money, they went into Wall Street, or maybe even management consulting. But you didn't go into tech to make money, you went to tech because you imagined possible futures. We're now in an environment where tech is very much about contemporary ways of making money. But it's more extreme than that. The expectation is that you know you have to grow fast and furious. You know you blitz scaling. The problem with scaling at that level is you bulldoze over people. You exacerbate inequalities. And that's one of the problems about a system that expects you to have a return on investment quarter by quarter, quarter by quarter. And that is built and baked into the system. And technologists who are trying to avoid the late stage capitalism structures right now are really struggling to do it. You don't get the support to be able to do things that are really helpful for a small community. Everything has to be at scale. But when you're at scale, you're homogenizing and you're guaranteeing structural inequities. Right. And that's what pains me, because when we talk about those questions of inequity and bias, we have to look at the economic systems that are manifesting this over and over again, in addition to the political systems that Eric is pointing out that really shape you know, the geopolitical dynamics of this. That relationship of geopolitical power plus late stage capitalism is going to put us in a place that is going to result in all these conversations like we've had for the last couple of weeks, right? Can Facebook even be a productive service? No, I, I think you, you've, you've articulated that very, very well, Dana. But it also brings me to this other conversation we often have in technology, which is, you know, often when we talk about technology, we're kind of presented with these polarities. On the one hand, the unbounded opportunities and possibilities that probably brought many to technology. But on the other hand, we've got all these societal questions and harms and issues that you're raising. I'm just curious, how should we think about these kind of polarities? And you know, what's the right way to think about them? Maybe Eric will, will you know, I'll, I'll go to you first. What do you think? How should we think about these? Yeah, polarities? you know, humanity has always had to grapple with the costs and benefits of powerful and enabling technologies. It goes back to our, the shaping of the first sharp objects by early homo sapiens, the, uh, the, the fashioning of our first uh, fires, uh, the widespread harnessing of electricity, flying machines, and now to the computational revolution. You know, we've managed to, to get through it uh, to in many, in many ways, viable ways to build civilization, uh, leverage uh, the powerful, useful, uh, potentially dangerous technologies for great benefit via wise reflection, ongoing innovations around building insightful applications, developing best practices, standards on safety, performance and robustness, and regulations. So I believe that we're in a unique position with computing, as I believe if you uh, take folks like Dana and others as being on it, we're on it. It's heartening to see the fast-paced rise of interests in ethics and responsibility around computing with discussions, research, mitigations on the technical and socio-technical and legal fronts. So I'm optimistic that by coming together across industry, academia, government, and civil society, we can address the costly behaviors and rough edges, as big and as macro as they may be, uh, and as uncertain as the influences are over time. And we can work continually uh, for goals like shared prosperity, equity, uh, uh, fairness, we can work to weight the cost benefit scale toward the benefit side for people and society. So let me just share some optimism, uh, given that I started out with a couple of dark <laughs> directions that, I, that I'm concerned about. Yeah, no, th 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 thank you, Eric, for that. But you know, you've, ra you've both raised so many big questions and issues. And typically, when these issues come up, uh, there are several solutions that are typically suggested as the ways to address this. And here, I'm going to suggest we go to the audience. I'm curious to hear what the audience thinks about this. So we're going to put up the typical things you hear, and there's four of them. 
Uh, and I'd be curious if the audience could pick which one, and it's just one, that they think is the most effective way to deal with these issues. Um, so I think the poll is going to go up. If you could go to your, uh, uh, to cast your vote, go to the vote here button. That's at the bottom of the chat column to cast your vote. Uh, I'd be curious to see what the audience thinks. And actually, I'll be quite curious, uh, uh, Dana and Eric, if you know which one you would pick too. Oh, oh wow! Did you see that? Can you see that result? Looks like you know the overwhelming favorite is regulation. That's interesting. So we may have to have another conversation, another panel, another day to discuss uh, regulation on these issues. But you know, we're going to try to bring this to a close. And I wanted to come back as a final point of our conversation perhaps to come back to our honoree, Andy. Andy's educated generations of computer scientists. And so it poses the question, how should we think about educating the next generation of computer scientists, given the sort of ethical issues we've discussed here? And uh, here, I'm gonna start with you, Dana. Any quick th last minute thoughts on how should we educate the next generation? Eric, I'm curious to hear your thoughts too. I mean, the thing that I think is important, we don't need to valorize people dropping out of school. Part of Andy's passion for undergrads is recognizing that you build whole rich people who actually can understand different ways of seeing and different ways of knowing. And the richness of Brown is that it really encourages that. You're not just studying computer science, you're interacting with a humanistic you know, context. And that's where I think part of this goes to your polarities. We often you know, think government regulation because we're in a polarity moment. We know that things are wrong. They're painful, but we need to build people and processes and systems that have checks and balances. And that starts with every individual also being you know, educated in order to have those checks and balances, to think of people as part of our broader ecosystem, to really make education not just about like learning how to do the technical work, but being able to see the technical work in a broader context. That's pretty compelling. Eric, what would you add to that? You know, with great power and influence comes great responsibility. And here we are with computer science and computing technologies, having such great power more than I ever had expected as a graduate student myself in this field. Uh, and, you know, the great responsibility, and as Andy has led on, extends to educating students about responsibility. Computer science teachers absolutely must introduce considerations of ethics and responsibility into the curricula and work to nurture an ethos about key issues, potential outcomes. Uh, that computer scientists and engineers need to consider when they build and field technologies. Uh, it's been wonderful to see Andy and other computer science educators developing and sharing interdisciplinary content on values, ethics, uh, and responsibilities. I see great value in having both standalone courses for undergraduates and graduate students, um, as well as um, uh, modules that are integrated or embedded into the traditional classes uh, on ethics, values, co-responsibilities, case studies, with, with, with outcomes and uncertainties. Thinking deeply about the impact of computer science and computing applications uh, in the complex um, open world is going to be and will continue to be an important area of reflection and a core component of computer science education. So thank you, Andy, for being a leader on these teaching responsibilities. I think on that note, we're going to have to bring this to a close. Again, Dana and Eric, thank you. Uh, and Andy, congratulations again. Congratulations, you, Andy. Wow, thanks. More than ever, we need to have open discussions about the perils and the promise of technology. James, Dana, and Eric, thank you for your thought-provoking discussion. So now what do you say? Let's go back and check in on Geo and Estella and share how their graphical works have evolved. First, let's go see what Geo has created. Wow, he has come such a long way with his sculpture. And now it's in a completely different environment. This is cool.
Now, let's check in on Estella. So incredible to see these creations are taking shape. It's so beautiful and they're doing it so fast, but time is ticking. probably should mention that both Gio and Estella told us that with a little bit more time, they would have been able to add so much more detail. But I think you'll agree that what we're seeing after just 20 minutes is pretty amazing. Okay, now we're just about ready to wrap it up. So add your final touches. Five, four, three, two, one, time's up. <laughs> wow, those 20 minutes really flew by. So now I wanna give our artists a chance to describe what they just created. So Gio, let's start with you. How about you tell us about your piece and how for you it is a manifestation of the CHM vision. Thank you. Um, so as I was sculpting this piece, um, in my head I, I was thinking of the orb uh, symbolizing Earth, uh, and the, the, the figure obviously symbolizing humanity as humanity is, is holding on protectively onto the orb. And the ring around the figure with the, the blue light um, in my head, uh, I was thinking about it as uh, it could symbolize technology, the circulation of technology and, and how it flows through us and through us through the planet um, and, and, and how we take care of it. Um, so, you know, it was, a, it was a fun 20 minutes to come up with, 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 uh, with this idea, but um, yeah, I, th I, I had fun and I'm fairly happy with it. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you, Gio, for creating such a beautiful sculpture. So now it's your turn, Estella, to tell us about your painting and how you approached the challenge. Share with us what you were thinking about. Thank you. Um, so I painted a lotus. Um, it's symbolic of um, kind of optimism and hope in a dark time. I think a lot about this era in humanity right now where we're all struggling and all affected by a global pandemic. Um, and how will we come out from this era? And what do we do about climate change? What are we doing in terms of taking care of each other as human beings? So these are a lot of things that have been on my mind since early 2020 as we all have been faced with such trying times. Um, and the lotus is something that came to mind for me as it's a flower that grows in muddy waters. It's something that thrives in darkness. And I just love that analogy. And I think about how we as people are coming together and helping each other. And I believe that technology can really help humanity as well. Um, I think that technology can be helpful for, for the environment and climate change. I think there's a major role in that. Um, I've been learning a lot about plants and botany and it's, it's been something that's been at the forefront of my mind. Um, so I believe the integration of technology, humanity and nature can come together to really help resolve a lot of the problems that we have right now. And that's the, the future that I want to create in this world. Well, Estella, that was fantastic to watch you paint and thank you for your stunning piece. And I want to thank both of you for being part of tonight's program. So, Daniel? That was amazing, captivating. Thank you, Gio and Estella, for sharing your creativity and demonstrating how you use these specialized tech tools to bring to life CHM's vision to shape a better future for humanity. 
If that's what the present looks like, I can't wait to see the future. And to help us paint that picture, we wanted to hear from you. So we pulled together a few of the videos that some of you have recently recorded on our virtual platform, including some of Andy's recent students, as well as others working at the intersection of technology and humanity. Voices for the future. Advancements in technology mean that everyone around the world, including people who may not have reliable access to food and water, have access to the internet. This tool can allow people everywhere to learn and grow and make change and connections if created and used with care. The future of humanity is inextricable from technology. You know, understanding how these technologies affect broader society is one of the things that we'll need to be able to understand because there are risks associated with some of these things um, when you talk about disinformation, misinformation, uh, and you know, not, not to be too hyperbolic, but the, the future of democracy. And so these things matter. My passion for technology came from not only understanding how it impacted our daily lives, but how it can actually inspire and empower the next generation to create a positive change in the world. I think technology has transformed the way that people tell stories. As a graphic designer, I use technology every day to communicate through visual storytelling, whether that's through infographics, through web, through video, animation, anything like that. Technology has transformed the way that I'm able to communicate my ideas and the ideas of people around me to the world. The next generation of technologists understand that there is great responsibility that comes with one's work, that there is value in slowing down to thoroughly consider the effects of our work. Tangibly, this could mean making sure that the software we design is accessible, or mitigating the environmental impacts of computing, or even just reflecting individually on whatever it is we're working on. As a teacher, I see how tech can help shape a better future for humanity every single day. Um, and giving more students access to education is what really improves our world and is going to make the world a better place. What can we possibly do to create the future? Because we're not bystanders. Each, every single one of us is a participant. So our jo job is not only to decode and to discover, but to use the knowledge to make it a better future. As we close tonight, I'd like to thank my co-host Nancy Duarte and to each of our remarkable participants. And I want to extend my hearty congratulations to Andy as our newest distinguished fellow at CHM. We're inspired by your work and your impact, and we're honored to now count you as part of our museum collection and the fellows community. Now, let's return to where we began, CHM, Computing, Humanity, and Meaning. These are threads that provide meaning and connect all of us in the past, present, and future. In a 1945 article published in The Atlantic entitled, As We May Think, Van Vere Bush, an icon of science, laid out a groundbreaking view of what would be possible in the information age. That fall, in a Red Cross library in a hut set on stilts at the edge of the jungle on a Philippine island, a young Navy radar technician stumbled across an issue of that magazine and read Bush's article which he subsequently credited for aligning his sights along the vector Bush had described. Fast forward 23 years. In 1968, that radar technician turned visionary, Doug Engelbart, presented the mother of all demos nearby in San Francisco, a landmark event which redefined the technological and social aspects of personal computing. As we heard earlier in the program, in the audience that day was Andy Van Dam. As so many have testified tonight through their stories and tributes, Andy has influenced how we interact with computers. He's exemplified how an innovator can impact multiple fields, how an educator and a mentor can transform the lives of generations of students who in turn are affecting millions of lives around the world. Van Dam, Engelbart, Bush were heirs to their legacy of amplifying human potential and unleashing creativity for the greater good of humanity. 
and their story is now part of our story. And that story is still unfolding. And CHM is transforming how we play a role in that story for millions around the world. So I'll close tonight with a call to action inspired by the words of Vannevar Bush. He closed his 1945 article in this way. The applications of science have built man a well-supplied house and are teaching him to live healthily therein. They've enabled him to throw masses of people against one another with cruel weapons. He may perish in conflict before he learns to wield that for his true good. Yet in the application of science to the needs and desires of man, it would seem to be a singularly unfortunate stage to lose hope as to the outcome. Here at CHM, we raise a banner of hope for the possibility to wield technology for our true good. Standing on the shoulders of giants, we can unlock the potential of human creativity. And building on the strengths of diverse voices, we can harness technology to serve everyone. As digital citizens, we can, in fact, we must work together to shape a better future for all of us.